Uh, Elizabeth Papua, Oko Ingoa, a te te noho o ki te whanganui a tara. I have the great privilege of introducing Jamie for other uh, Jamie has recently joined Tanta Public to head up their evaluation practice in New Zealand. Um, he has over 25 years experience in evaluation and impact assessment uh, and especially specialising in international development projects for the British government. Today, Jamie will reflect on his evaluation of the Newton, Newton Fund and how a uh, theory of change can be both a, uh, an advantage or and also a disadvantage. But I'll, I'll let you talk about the Newton Fund and, and what and your reflections on theories of change. So over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Elizabeth. I think 25 years experience just means I'm old, right? That's kind of what... <laughs> well, uh, well, good morning, Australia. Good afternoon, New Zealand. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to talk to you today. Um, uh, have you got the slides to pull up? Yeah. 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 Hopefully you'll see those shortly. Um, and we... There we go. So, yes, I was just going to... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yes, as Elizabeth said, I've just uh, I was going to talk today mostly around theory of change, um, and largely based on my experiences um, on a project called the Newton Fund, um, which was a well a largely UK funded program uh, that I worked on for a number of years um, before I made the move down to to New Zealand, which was only a few months ago. So I'm hoping. Um, well, it's a UK project. I think some of the things I'm going to talk about today are, you know, are transferable in terms of some of the, the learning. Um, it's less about the project itself. It's about, you know, how, how we use a theory of change and how others use a theory of change. So, yeah, if you just click to the next slide. Um, just in terms of overview, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Here we are. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit, just a bit of introduction about theories of change and why we as evaluators tend to love theories of change. Um, but then also start thinking about, well, hang on, what's the broader purpose of these? Um, and sometimes, and so sort of the fundamental thing I want to talk about today is how an evaluation focus can make a theory of change less useful, perhaps. And I'm sort of building the whole discussion um, around basically a case study um, of an evaluation I worked on uh, in the UK called the Newton Fund. And I'll explain a bit more about, about what that fund was um, and what the evaluation focused on. Um, so yeah, and this was, um, as I say, I'm, I'm new to New Zealand. I've spent the last, well, we had 20 odd years doing evaluation in the UK and the last eight years doing an international development evaluations. And this was one of these um, that was funded through overseas development assistance money, which had some additional challenges. But again, I'm not gonna get into that. And I'm not really gonna talk about the evaluation findings themselves. You may have some questions at the end around that, but I'm really just talking around this notion around theory of change as a bit of a think piece as to how, how useful or not they might be. And um, I don't know, evaluation humor, I love this cartoon. It's one of my favorites. It's about kind of, you know, how, how do we think about things and how do sometimes our clients think about things in terms of um, how change happens? So yeah, if you click to the next slide, please. Oh, that's backwards. There we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, this was just a little bit of history. Uh, some of you may well be familiar with this. Um, and theory of change does, you know, have its roots in evaluation, really. Um, and it came about um, through some of these Aspen round tables um, back in the sort of mid '90s. Uh, and it was Carol Weiss who gave, you know, the sort of the first definition, really, um, of what a theory of change was. I mean, I won't read this out, but again, essentially, her hypothesis was that, you know. If, if all your stakeholders um, are unclear about the process of change, about what, what you're trying to achieve through a programme, um, then it becomes very hard to then, you know, evaluate and understand, um, you know, what it has achieved. And that was the notion of these sort of mini steps that lead to long term goal and sort of transform then into the theory of change that sets out these, you know, logical, logical steps, the causal pathway, call it what you like, uh, in terms of how, you know, the various activities might ultimately lead to what we would understand now as, you know, as outcomes and impacts. Um, so that's kind of where it started. And I guess now we're all very familiar uh, with the theories of change and, and use them in our work. And if you click to the next slide, 
Um, this was my kind of uh, very loose summary of kind of why evaluators now love theories of change. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, you know, if we don't know what it is that the funders and implementers of these these projects or programs are trying to achieve or how they're trying to achieve that, then we're a bit lost. You know, what, what are we evaluating? Are we going to evaluate the right things? Um, and, you know, how are we going to do that? And we need them to understand the rationale behind the program. So then, you know, to evaluate whether it makes a difference or not. And I originally worried that was what worked or not. And, you know, there's a whole debate around that, but let's not get into that. But um, we need to understand that um, so that we can, you know, focus the evaluation really, because sometimes you can't evaluate everything. You need to focus on what's important. Um, and the theory of change helps us do that. And that's my final point there, really, because if there is this theory to begin with, we can explore around the very loose, loose terminology. But to try and understand why a theory that you know looks great on paper maybe doesn't work in practice, or maybe there are some nuances to it that have you know that weren't considered in the theory, or various underlying assumptions that, um, whether articulated or not, had a real impact um, on whether uh, a program was successful or not. So, a theory change can be really useful. It can help guide and focus an evaluation. It helps us to decide, you know, what, what do we need to collect data on? Where do we need to um, focus our efforts in terms of implementing an evaluation and what sort of tools we might use? Uh, and it can also help understand the context. And uh, I think that's an important part as well. You know, what is the wider context in which an intervention is taking place? And what are the some of the maybe the external factors that might um, influence or impact on whether a program is ultimately successful or not? So we love them, and sorry if you click to the next slide. Um, I guess my question for today is, well, okay, we as evaluators um, love these, um, but how useful are they for the funders of these programs, the implementers of the programs, the people actually on the ground delivering them? Um, and in theory, I guess they should be useful. I mean, particularly in cases where funders haven't thought through this logic, um, and that was very much the case in the example I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so it did help sort of unpack that a bit and understand, you know, that, that process of change, those causal pathways. Um, but they're also, you know, sometimes misunderstood. Uh, and I've seen oftentimes theories of change or something that's presented as a theory of change, I wouldn't consider it to be that. It's, you know, a results framework, a strategic framework, a log frame, I don't know. We have all these terminology for different things, but uh, to me, they're not often theories of change, even though, you know, my, my client, the funder might think that it is, uh, it might not mean that to me as an evaluator. Um, and the fundamental question for me is, well, do they use the theory of change? Uh, I think they're most often produced, um, you know, by evaluators or in the process of designing an evaluation. The funders might might do that themselves. Um, but, you know, do they use it? Do they reflect on it? Do they update it? Um, because, you know, in my view, theories of change shouldn't be static things. You don't you know, have a theory of change at the start of a program and then um, not update it and refine it as time goes on, because inevitably, things change, projects change, um, the context changes. So they should always be living documents, in my view, rather than sort of fixed, rigid um, constructs that, that, that don't change from the beginning to an end uh, of a program. So I guess what I'm talking about today is, well, how do we make sure that they're useful? And I'm sort of basing that around um, this um, example of the Newton Fund, um, which is a program in the UK. And I think, sorry, I can't see the chat, but I think, um, and I noticed Penny Hawkins popped up on the, the attendee list. So Penny was actually part of the, um, oh God, what did we call it now? It was the Evaluation Steering Group or something. Uh, so it was a cross-governmental group in the UK that actually came together to advise on the design uh, of this evaluation. So it's uh, nice to connect to Penny, a small world. Um, so you'll be familiar with, with some of this, having been involved in those early stages of the, of the programme. Uh, sorry, so yeah, if you click the next slide, I'm just going to give some brief background on the Newton Fund because it's kind of important context to... Where, end, where we ended up with this theory of change. Um, and so I sort of, I led the, the design and the implementation of this, obviously working with a team. Um, I worked with a company called Tetra Tech at the time in the UK, uh, and it was a longitudinal evaluation. It was originally planned over five years. Um, interestingly, it was commissioned one year after implementation had already started. So lots of things were already underway um, before um, evaluation was commissioned. Um, we ended up adopting a theory-based approach. I'm not going to go into you know, 
why we did that or what the evaluation design was. I really just want to focus on the theory of change aspect for today, but there were some various reasons why, why we landed on a theory-based approach for the evaluation. Uh, and as ever, I guess as consultants, we probably get always accused of this. Um, ambitious scope and limited budget, um, always a challenge um, for evaluators. Uh, but I think maybe you'll see, you know, I guess complexity was one of the main challenges with this. Um, and I'll sort of demonstrate that um, a bit further in the next couple of slides, just as a bit of context. So if you click to the next one. So fundamentally, what was the Newton Fund all about? Well, I mean, ultimately, it had this goal of um, supporting economic development and social welfare. Uh, and it was all about tackling global challenges. Um, and this was all in the context of um, overseas development assistance. Um, so it was very much that aid, aid budget that was funding this programme. And that placed certain limitations on you know, how, how that money could be spent uh, and also where to some extent. Uh, so the UK um, put in a, was around £700 million uh, to fund this programme. Um, and it was intended that that would be co-funded uh, with various partner countries uh, that they were going to work with to do this. Uh, and it was all about building um, research and innovation partnerships across the globe um, to tackle some of these development issues um, and to develop um, skills and talent um, in, in research and innovation. And it was structured around these three pillars of activity. Um, so people, research and translation. Uh, the people pillar was, well, kind of, as his name suggests, it was all about capacity building. Uh, it was focused on individual researchers, so providing them with capacity building, funding research projects, um, what they called mobility schemes, so sort of enabling um, sort of transfers of people. So researchers from one country would come to the UK, UK researchers would go to another country and sort of, sort of build, build their skills, build their knowledge through um, international working. Uh, research was the middle pillar. Um, I think it was the, the pillar that received the most funding. And this was about international research collaborations. Uh, and it was intended to deliver truly collaborative research between countries, um, again, focused around tackling these global development challenges. And then there was this third pillar, uh, which they called translation, um, which was um, kind of, okay, well, what happens next after the research? How do you translate that into um, policy? So can we use this research uh, to translate and influence policy around some of these development challenges? Um, or indeed, it could be other things too about commercialization of um, products uh, or, of, or of ideas. So it was that kind of, um, think about it as kind of like a, a pathway between, okay, you can develop good research skills, you can develop the good research then, and that research will hopefully lead to something um, as a result, rather than just being good research for the sake of research was kind of the, the theory behind it. Um, and if you just click to the next one, um, it was complex, put it that way. Um, so the, the fund actually in the end operated uh, in 18 countries. Um, when it started, there were 15. Um, some were added later on and some dropped out for various reasons. Uh, there were seven uh, UK delivery partners. So all the uh, UK research councils uh, and a number of others. Um, so the, the academies um, and the British Council and the Med Office uh, were all involved as delivery partners, all with their own uh, funding envelopes to deliver activities under all three pillars. Um, some of them worked under all pillars, some of them worked just under some. Uh, and similarly, some of them worked in some countries and some of them not. So we had this really complex program of all these countries with many different things happening in each of them by different partners. Um, and well, if you can, I know the map's quite small, but very different contexts in which um, all of this work was happening. Uh, so you can see there, there's some sort of big, big hitters there, I suppose, in terms of, you know, China, South Africa, Brazil, where research infrastructures were quite well developed. But then you had others where they were much less well developed. Um, so depending on the what would you call it, the, the innovation ecosystem and how sort of developed or advanced that was, the activities varied um, to, to respond to that local context. And in some places where it was you know, far less developed, um, Kazakhstan was one that springs to mind uh, that was in at the start where you know, it didn't have that same uh, research and innovation infrastructure as China would. And that necessarily reflected the way um, funding was, was being channeled into activities. So some focus much more on the, the the translation pillar, uh, while others focus much more on the people pillar, reflecting 
um, where where perhaps the most need was in terms of uh, bringing on those um, innovation structures within each of those countries. And yeah, the, the bits on the side, again, I'm just trying to um, overemphasize the complexity of all this for the number of projects, the number of organizations involved um, in terms of actually delivering a meaningful evaluation because we were contracted to deliver a fund level evaluation. Um, so we had to kind of capture the entirety um, of all of this um, in that evaluation work. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, and I guess some additional challenges for us, the objectives were not very clearly defined at the outset. Uh, so I've said there, you know, on paper, it was about advancing research and innovation, um, both in the UK and in the, all of these partner countries involved. Um, there were no targets, there were no country plans, so there weren't kind of specific plans of activity for each country. And there was no monitoring system, uh, or at least no standardized monitoring system to capture all these activities. So you had all the partners who had slightly different systems, um, but no common understanding of um, you know metrics that we might use uh, for an evaluation. So that was a big challenge for us at the start. Um, and I guess the other thing that became clear quite early on was that actually there was sort of an unwritten objective around this, which was about advancing UK foreign policy interests uh, and sort of using this fund in a way to open doors to other things for the UK government uh, in some of these countries. Um, which was again kind of an interesting one and it actually kind of explains you know some of our early work kind of question well hang on why have you chosen some of these countries as partners because if you were looking at ones with you know the most advanced um you know innovation systems or the ones which might offer the greatest leaps forward in terms of um addressing development challenges they might not be the ones you would pick but there was some of this political driver behind some of the, some of those decisions to include some countries um, so again, that was interesting as well. I mean, that wasn't something we were particularly explicitly trying to evaluate, but we ended up with some useful findings around the extent to which the fund did that. Um, but because I think, you know, because it was largely a politically driven program, uh, where we started was that this logic of the program, this theory of change, it didn't exist. It wasn't fully thought through. So they had this notion about, um, you know, supporting science, research and innovation across all these countries. But um, the idea of an intervention logic was, you know, it, it wasn't there. Um, and that's where we started. Um, so if you click to the next slide, very early task for us when we commenced this um, work was to actually develop uh, the theory of change. And um, we did, as you can imagine, with something this complex, with this many partners, uh, we tried to make that as participatory as possible. Uh, we got lucky at the start because uh, there was a, a sort of a global gathering of all of the um, in-country teams in each of these countries that they assembled uh, in London. And we were able to get on the agenda for that and actually get those teams working together to think through, you know, what is this logic? And we facilitated, you know, discussions to try and unpack, you know, what is it they were doing and how does this ultimately lead to change? And on top of that, obviously, we we consulted with our client base, the Department of um, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, as it was at the time, uh, and the management team in the UK. Uh, we also did some familiarization visits to certain countries, not solely for the purpose of the theory of change, but to just get our heads around the, you know, this whole program and what it was doing, how it was structured. But also that allowed us to capture the views of, because it was our partnership program, we wanted to make sure we captured the views of the local funding partners, the partners in other countries, um, to make sure we reflected that in this design of the, the theory of change. Um, so yes, yeah, so we had various uh, kind of you know workshops uh, and activities to to try and develop this theory of change to capture this incredibly complex program um, for us to then be able to come up with a plan to evaluate it. Um, and hold your breath, everyone. If we click to the next slide, um, this is where we kind of landed as our first iteration of the theory of change, which, as you can see, is kind of super complex uh, and I'm not going to talk you through this you probably can't even read it but don't worry um, but as you can see what it did enable us to do um, so you get to the bottom you've got the three pillars uh, and we tried to capture the vast you know variety of different activities that were happening there and then sort of you know follow that process through to say well, what are the outputs of that uh, and the outcomes are sort of the dark boxes in the middle we were able to agree these three core outcomes um, that everyone agreed um, that the program was working towards. Um, and then I guess perhaps one of the most enlightening parts was that going from there to the ultimate objective, right at the top, that impact statement around science and innovation partnerships being strengthened, there was a huge leap between these outcomes and that impact. Uh, so those sort of four layers of intermediate 
outcomes, intermediate impacts, call them what you want, um, was quite a quite a long road. So that was quite enlightening in itself in terms of well, what does the theory of change uh, mean for us? Um, and then I mean, it was useless. I don't know what haven't shown here actually uh, were all the assumptions. So underpinning all this, there were like you know twenty seven odd assumptions about that were being made through all of these these pathways about you know what needed to be in place for this to happen, uh, and we were able to articulate all those as well, which I think was of some use to to the client and uh, general understanding. Well, actually, here's some issues we need to get a handle on or things we need to be monitoring. Um, and we tried, given this was so complex and a bit of a bit of a jumble, we did try to kind of unpack it a bit. And if you clip to the next slide, just in terms of the sort of visual um, representation, we unpacked it by each pillar and this sort of reverses it. We've got activities on the top on this one, uh, working its way down to those, those fund level results to try and unpack it a bit and understand what we're doing. And here you can see some of the assumptions and we, we mapped all of those onto the, the diagram. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so I mean, that was quite very useful for us to work out, okay, what are all these pathways? Um, what, you know, what is supposed to lead to, to what and when? Um, and some of these hadn't really been articulated before. Um, so that was quite a, a useful exercise in itself. Um, but I think our big issue, and I think if you click to the next slide, was that given um, all of this, I mean, the evaluation team, I've said loved it. That's maybe a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but it was certainly a really useful evaluation tool. Um, so yes, it was super complex, but it did really unpack and uh, you know give a representation of these clear logical steps, uh, all of the things that needed to happen to ultimately achieve the things that the fund wanted to achieve. Uh, it gave us a framework to then identify, well, okay, how can we try to measure and track these results pathways and therefore design some appropriate evaluation approaches and tools to be able to do that. Um, we identified those assumptions, some of which were untested, and we tried to then build that into the evaluation design. Uh, and then we ultimately used it to create this detailed evaluation framework of, okay, how are we going to evaluate this program over this five-year period? Um, so in that sense, it was super useful, um, but it was very much designed um, for an evaluation purpose. Uh, and as you see, I mean, there was a narrative that went with all this, of course, it's not just about the, the diagram, but... Um, even that, it was really complex for delivery partners and the client to get their head around it. Uh, what does all this mean? What do I do with this? Am I supposed to do anything with this? Or is it just something that the evaluators do? And that's kind of where we ended up. It's like, oh, that's an evaluation thing. So we don't need to engage with that too much. Um, so they couldn't really see the benefit of it beyond evaluation, um, which I think kind of fair enough, right? And that's kind of um, what led us to to the next stage of work, which was sort of recognizing that, but then thinking, well, okay, how can we make this more useful? And so if you click to the next slide, um, so, you know, as, as time went on, we sort of recognized this. And we had this challenge of the funders in different countries trying to work out, you know, over an extended time frame, you would have new people coming on board to the program and others dropping off because it was over, you know, this five-year time period. Um, trying to engage with this and understanding what this program was all about was all about um, was quite tricky. So we sort of collectively agreed uh, ourselves and the client to, we called it a refresh of the theory of change um, to, I mean, partly to reflect some changes that happened um, over that period, uh, but also with a much stronger focus on the usefulness of the theory of change beyond beyond our evaluation purposes. So yeah, to make it more useful for more people. Um, you know, as I say, that first attempt was really an evaluation tool. We didn't think enough about other audiences and how they might use it, particularly those partners in other countries, um, but also the delivery partners here in the UK who, you know, I think with program, programs of this type, they tend to focus on what do we need to deliver, the outputs, right, and are not necessarily thinking day to day about, well, what's the, what's the, I was going to say, what's the point of those outputs, but you know what I mean, in terms of, you know, how do those outputs lead to this broader concept of change that we're, that we're trying to achieve. So we went through a very similar process to UpData. Again, it was very participatory. We tried to engage as many people in that process um, as we could. Um, and I think if you click to the next slide, we should see where we ended up in terms of this new version. Um, and visually, it's a lot cleaner. And, and again, I'll come on to that in a minute. It's not all about the fancy diagram, but actually, in terms of simplifying uh, some of the content uh, of that previous version. I mean, it's fundamentally not different in terms of the story it's telling. You know, the, the activities, the pillars haven't changed, the long-term outcomes haven't really changed, but we just represented them and sort of 
um, grouped them together in a much simpler way that try to emphasize how all of this comes together as a cohesive program um, rather than just a, a set of individual boxes. And again, I'm not expecting you to um, read all this in detail. I think it is the reports were all published. Um, if you Google around, you'll be able to find those. Uh, and you can, you'll also see at the top, uh, we mapped all our evaluation questions against different elements of this. That's the little circles at the top, if you can see them, um, to we mapped our evaluation questions across all of this to demonstrate, well, we know what are we going to be able to answer? What can we say about the uh, achievements um, of this fund overall? Um, and this, and again, with the, the narrative that went with it, provided a much um, clearer statement, I think, on the rationale of the programme. Um, I can't see it, but the box at the end that, that currently my face is covering um, showed the ultimate impact of the programme. Um, but it, you know, it was much clearer. And what we found was that, um, you know, that our partners found this a much more useful tool. They could sort of engage with this in a much clearer way. They could see where they fitted into this whole network of, of what was happening and kind of how all of those things were ultimately supposed to lead to these these different impacts. Um, so as a visual tool, um, it was certainly much more useful uh, to do that. And it was used quite extensively. And the feedback we had was really, you know, positive from these partners. You know, oh, gosh, I can finally see, you know, you know, kind of why I'm doing this or how it's going to lead to these things that uh, ultimately the, the fund was trying to achieve. They might not be the things the partners were doing directly, but they were all supposed to lead towards these these shared outcomes, uh, these shared vision of success. Um, so, yeah. So what did we learn from all this? And sorry if you click to the next slide, just to sort of sum up. Um, so yeah, I guess where I started. Um, for me, theories of change are of limited value unless they're actually used by the funders and implementers of these programs. In this case, you know, as I said, you know, none of this had really been thought through in much detail when we started. So this was a really useful exercise in, in defining these realistic long-term goals and outcomes um, for this program. Uh, it was also useful in agreeing what, what are the, the necessary preconditions for success, you know, what needs to be in place, testing those assumptions, articulating those assumptions um, in a way that perhaps hadn't been done before, uh, which was useful for then the funders, the members think about, well, actually, we need to do something about this because, you know, if we don't do that, you know, if there isn't the funding in place, if there aren't networks in place, if there's no diffusion of knowledge that happens after someone's been on a, in an exchange program, you know, none of these things happen. Um, so it enabled them to start thinking about that and perhaps tweaking some of their programs a bit to try and ensure that those things took place. So I think that was a positive, positive outcome. Um, and then if you click to the next one, um, I guess perhaps the biggest one for me, but actually it's the process of developing the theory of change in this collaborative participatory way is more important than anything else, more important than the fancy diagram. I mean, it looks great, but, you know, so what? Um, but actually engaging those partners in that process and the interaction between the different partners. When you've got a program as complex as this, you've got people doing very different things in very different countries, but actually getting them together to share their experiences and their challenges. Um, but then finally to be able to come together to deliver the shared outcome uh, was really, really useful. Um, and not only, you know, an understanding the complexity, but understanding where there were some shared experiences. That was another big challenge with this program is with all these things happening in different places, how do you actually capture the knowledge, the learning um, that, that come through all of this? Uh, so sort of through this process, uh, there was an, an opportunity to, to share that learning, to engage more directly and, uh, you know, overcome some of these shared challenges that previously they'd, you know, been sort of thinking about in isolation, uh, which was useful. And I think it, all, it helped us as evaluators to challenge our thinking. You know, how do we go about better linking the work of these programs to the outcomes uh, and to help people to see these routes to impact and how long it might take? I mean, this fund, it was always envisaged that these impacts would be further down the line, you know, 10 years down the line, even though the evaluation work would have stopped long before then. Uh, but this was able to sort of set that out much more clearly and understanding what are the, the things that need to happen long after this fund has ended for any of these impacts to be to be visible. Um, and fundamentally for us as evaluators, we have to explain clearly to our client, to our funders, to the partners, you know, what are the benefits um, for the UK and for the partner countries of all of these um, different activities. So um, I think 
Um, I've sort of rattled through some of that. If I click to the next slide, it's just my final slide. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that we're obviously, this wasn't just me, this was a huge team effort uh, from the team at Tetra Tech. And I particularly wanted to thank Aoife Murray. She um, really led all this work on this redesign of the theory of change. Uh, but more than that, she was the one sort of driving this this need uh, for the theory of change to be more useful. So a uh, really big thanks to, to Ify Murray for, um, for all of that work. So yes, I've rattled through that. I hope it was interesting. It was just some reflections from that, that work I'd done over the past few years on that project. I'm very happy to take any questions uh, or comments from anyone. I can't see the chat. I'm gonna see if I can pull that up now. Thank you so much, Jamie, for this extremely, um illuminating presentation on the complexity of a multi-program, like multi-budget global um, fund. Since we don't have um, any questions in the chat, please everyone feel free to pop your questions in the chat or um, turn your hand up. Um, I'm gonna ask you the first question, um, Jamie, just, just an indication of how difficult was it to streamline the programs of the various various countries and what challenges did you face when it came to agreeing on, agreeing on the outcomes as well as the methodology of um, demonstrating value for money or um, cost effectiveness since it is a budget support evaluation i'm just i'm just wondering you know in the different countries in the di different country context how how difficult was it to get agreement on on the methodology mm. Um, gosh, there are a few questions in there. Um, so agreeing the outcomes actually, on reflection, I don't think that was that was so difficult. Um, I think the client was pretty clear on in their heads anyway. If they hadn't written it down as to kind of what the outcomes were, um, and if you sort of break it down at its most simple level, you know, if we were funding research, what should the outcome of that be? Um, I think the process so agreeing those sort of core outcomes wasn't so difficult. Um, what was more difficult was understanding and the pathways of how you actually get there. And then, as I sort of hinted, that sort of, well, beyond outcomes, you know, how do we get to impacts, right? Um, that was a much more challenging part around how how that process would work, given that once you're at that level, it's much more outside your control, right? There are all these other external factors and influences that um, impact your ability to do that. Um Sorry, I'm just getting a question in the chat, which is sort of related as well. Um, the challenge of kind of agreeing um, clear and correct outcomes. Yeah, I mean, it was a challenge, but it was interesting actually getting everyone in the room because in a way the funder was dictating some of this, right? Um, so this is what we want this to achieve. Um, so getting all these country partners on board uh, was interesting. It was a challenge in some respects because of the co-funding aspect and this being uh, this overseas development assistance money. There are still only certain things you're allowed to spend that money on. And what some of the challenges they faced were that some of the funding partners wanted to do other things that weren't eligible for this UK government spend. And that created some challenges because they wanted to do things that just were not eligible for funding. And that created some challenges with those partners in terms of trying to agree what do we, well, what does success look like for them, right? Because they wanted things that were slightly different to what the UK was able to support, put it that way. Um, so um, again, the collaborative aspect of that was critical because I think, you know, if, if we hadn't been able to get all these people in, I'll well, say the room or the rooms that we did this sort of various exercises in, I'm not sure we would have got there, particularly for that final version. Uh, it was really important. There was a shared vision of success for all of this. Um, and I think we did get there in the end, but it did require spending that time, that energy, uh, to actually get people in the room and talk through this together and actually understand it and ask their questions they wanted about about these pathways. Um, so, yeah, so that was Sabine's question. I've sort of segued into that. Um, but, yeah, your question about value for money, that was really challenging um, for this evaluation. Um, and actually, towards the end of it, it was the, the client kind of wanted to implement a new rubric for how they wanted to measure the value for money of this programme. Uh, and it just took such a long time. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the lack of monitoring data was a real problem for us. We didn't have any of that data, even some basic basic concepts of like, you know, cost per output or whatever. You know, we can do any of that. There was no standard monitoring. And we've been sort of right from the get go. We're saying, please, 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 can we have some standard monitoring and actually collect this data? Uh, so we couldn't do some of that. So, 
Yeah, so the value theorem was a real challenge in the end. And I think our evaluation report doesn't talk much to that because it kind of went off and became its own thing. This fund sort of became not merged, but it, there was another similar fund called the Global Challenges Research Fund that they kind of then put together in the same management and wanted to introduce a new value for money framework for both of them. Um, so we, in our evaluation, didn't ultimately um, get into a detailed value for money assessment because it was so complicated and because we're lacking a lot of the information to, to do that. So does that answer all your questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, absolutely. There's heaps more in the chat. Um, Todd, Todd, would you like to unmute yourself, Todd, and, and ask, ask Jamie directly? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I found the mute button. Yeah, no, look, um, I appreciate the mammoth effort that you've kind of unpacked there and kind of getting so many different perspectives and uh, experiences um, to a shared kind of understanding. And yeah, I'm just interested, I suppose, in terms of how to move from kind of a simple linear model to something that it kind of reflects the reality on the ground. Um, you know, and sometimes programs do work nice and simply and as we expect, but I suppose my experience is oftentimes I don't. So how do we um, then reflect that with the stakeholders of the reality of moving on from a simple linear model? Just wonder if you've got any reflections on that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think a theory of change, the fancy diagram anyway, is always going to be an oversimplification of any program, uh, but they can be quite useful in sort of starting that discussion. And I think that's where the, I think the question previous to this is what did you learn? What do you do differently? Because we kind of started with the complexity and then came back to the more, the simple, the simple better. So the lesson would be, I think, was to switch that around. Can we at least get this sort of basic logic, a basic understanding of this before we got into the complexity? Uh, and then having that collaborative process to unpack that, um, that's where, um, yeah, that, those sort of exercises, doing that collaboratively, these workshops, these sessions, some shared learning, but all of that would be useful. The other thing that was sort of missing here, I think I mentioned at the start, was the lack of a clear um, strategy within each of these countries, because the, the model was different in each country. Uh, and at one point we were suggesting, well, hang on, you know, shouldn't you really have like a nested theory of change for each country? Because the pathways were very different in different countries. Um, and that would have been super useful as an exercise. Even like developing that strategy for a country would have helped those working in that country to understand, okay, well, what are we trying to do here? Uh, it, would have, it would have simplified some of that fund level complexity into, okay, what are we doing in Mexico or China or wherever? Um, and able to focus a bit more on well, what affects me rather than, because some of these fund level concepts were a bit abstract at times um, for, for some people engaged in it. So it's kind of boiling it down to that level, even a very simplified, version of what success looks like, what we're trying to achieve in each country, would have been a real benefit to this program. Uh, and I think that would have helped because then if you're, if you take it down to those manageable chunks, um, it becomes much easier then to, to get into that messy stuff. Okay, what are the messy issues here rather than trying to do it at fund level? I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but it's just sort of, kind of my reflections on, on, on the Newton Fund in terms of how that might have gone better in this case. Fine, thanks. Thank you, Jamie. There's a, um, I think you have already answered Hadil's question as well. well um, I was wondering what you think is more appropriate and useful for a theory of change, a detailed or a high-level one? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess more useful for who, right? That was kind of where I started this whole thing. Um, I think maybe the sort of simplified one uh, can be really useful for maybe someone who's not in the evaluation world, but is just trying to get their head around, what's this all about? What are we trying to achieve? And how are they thinking about getting there? Uh, I think that simple representation, representation can be really useful for that. Um, I think as evaluators, we probably do need the more, the more in-depth, the more complicated one. It maybe doesn't need to be one that's shared widely, you know, with partners and others, but as evaluators, we need to understand that. And, you know, the, the funders need to understand that, I think. So I think it's, horses for courses right i think um i don't i don't think there's ever gonna be a definitive answer to to that one um, 
Rula, Rula is asking about navigating the unwritten objectives. Rula, feel free to unmute yourself and um, elaborate if you, if you wish. Um, yeah, I, I think it was probably an intense um, process to um, navigate that and also because it's uh, a lot of different uh, contexts from the uh, different uh, partners that uh, James worked with. So I'm wondering, um, the unwritten is currently written on the screen for us, but um, how did you capture that and how, how was that helpful? Did it benefit the project to sit that on the table, um, define it, measure it, um, see what can be done next, if it's uh, useful in another project or stage. I'm just fascinated because it's, it's already complex with written objectives, let go of other unwritten objectives. So just if you can uh, speak to us a little bit about that, please. Sure. Yeah, it was a really tricky one because it was never really written. Uh, and particularly because, uh, you know, all of this work was being published and, you know, the UK government didn't particularly want to be advertising the fact that, you know, there were some of these sort of wider foreign policy goals behind this this programme. Um, so, you know, kind of saying to partners, oh, you know, this is what we're trying to do in our evaluation plan was not the right thing to do. So they were never really written down. Um, but in the way we designed some of our consultations, some of the case study work we did uh, in the different countries, we did try to tease out some of this about, well, actually, what were the wider benefits of this? Uh, in terms of these opening doors and you know leveraging other other funds, and I think um, I'm going to front of me right now, but the theory of change sort of hints at some of those things about leading to these you know, broader collaborations. So they were kind of framed in wording that was a lot more vague uh, than I put it on the screen today, that allowed us to to unpack a little bit in our case study work and kind of consultations with you know some of the high level <clears throat> government officials in these countries to unpack a bit. Well, you know what did this, what else did this lead to? So we were able to unpack some of that, but it wasn't done in a super structured way. Um, it was, well, I'm not going to say anecdotal, but there was kind of a lot of evidence we tried to gather about, you know, to what extent that it actually lead to benefits beyond anything that the Newton Fund was on paper supposed to be achieving. Um, so yeah, they never really became written, although we did talk to them in sort of more vague terms in the evaluation report about um, how this had led to, you know, other collaborations, other developments between the, the UK and these countries. asks how often did you update your theory of change given that things change in five years yeah, we did. We only really did it twice in this case because yeah, it was quite a long time period and uh, it was the nature of evaluation we, you know, we were in. We did a lot of baseline work and then there was a period where we didn't do anything at all. Right. It was kind of the nature of um, evaluation where there were kind of intense periods, uh, interim and final evaluation stage. So in this case, we only really updated it twice. So this was the one we did at the beginning, the first one I showed. And the one we did well before we started the the end line evaluation, um, I think it may have been useful to, to kind of think about that a bit more earlier. Um, it would have been great if, again, I'm sort of doing my uh, 2020 hindsight, but if we'd had that much more simplified theory of change earlier, I would have loved to have seen the client take more ownership of that and have them sort of reflect and update on it, and we could have worked with them to do that. But for them to kind of take more ownership over that, to reflect the way the project was um, evolving and emerging and expanding. Um, but yeah, for us, if I, we only really did the exercise twice. But I think, again, on reflection, it would be useful to do that more often. But as I say, it's kind of, I feel the ownership of some of that needs to rest with the, the funders, the clients of some of these programs. Thank you. That is absolutely um, fascinating. Can I ask, is the fund still going? Say that again, sorry? Is the fund still active? Is it still being implemented to the same uh, countries with the same partners? Oh, um, gosh. Well, they were about to, well, I'm not sure where it's at now, actually, because we finished our work about a year or two back. Uh, and there were various discussions at that point around what happens next, and it was running alongside this Global Challenges Research Fund. So I think it may still be going, but it might be in a slightly different form now. Um, sorry, I'm not, um, I haven't kept up to speed. I've been too focused on moving to New Zealand lately to get up to speed on where uh, I was just thinking, thinking of the long-term outcomes, it'll be, it'll be wonderful to, to kind of um, 
do a before and after kind of capturing? Well, did we get it right? You know, did, did so our was, hypothesis? As I was um, leaving the UK, it was one of the things that was being talked about. Um, Bayes, the client, uh, really wanted to do this sort of post implementation impact study. Um, but I'm not sure where they got to with that. There were all sorts of um, funding challenges in the UK. Um, so they were talking about that before I left, whether they actually managed to secure the funding for that, I don't know. But there was certainly an interest in doing that and having that kind of, okay, a few years out, where are we looking now? Because that, you know, our evaluation ended, we, we weren't really to say, say anything at all about impacts. And even some of those sort of higher level outcomes, we were only really able to talk about progress towards those outcomes. Um, so yeah, the clients are the benefit in doing something further, but it was sort of outside the scope of our contract at the time. Thank you. Um, everyone, we have about 10 minutes. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask more questions. Um, we can have an open conversation. We only have 30 people right now. It's, it's dropping in. Feel free to... Um, Ask more questions from Jamie and make the most of 10 minutes we have from its vast amount of experience and knowledge. Um, as we are waiting, Jamie, I was just wondering, did you have a huge evaluation team on your side? How many people were, you know, in terms of partners? Um, so for us delivering the evaluation, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, huge. I wouldn't say huge. Um, so yeah, Tetrek in the UK has a reasonably big evaluation team. There were about oh, 20 odd of us at the time. They weren't all working on this project. Uh, we also partnered with um, some other firms to to deliver some of the, the specialist work on some of the innovation work that we didn't feel particularly specialized in. We brought them on board. But then we then had to... Uh, we ended up with kind of a case study design. So we did visits to various these countries to inform the valuation and doing case studies of different things that were happening. Uh, and we engaged there with basically teams of researchers in each of those countries to help gather that information, navigate those landscapes. Um, so I, yeah, I suppose when I think about it, it was quite a big team. Um, it didn't necessarily feel like it when I was sat there in London with you know two or three people around me, but actually the whole thing, bringing it all together was, was quite a big team. Thanks so much. We have a question from Ruth. The process link people in each country more upskilled um, in theory of change and evaluation. Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I need to go back and ask them. I need to do another evaluation. Um, I'd like to think so. Um, I think um, yeah, certainly some of them could see kind of what I was saying about kind of making this more useful beyond just evaluation. Could then understand why evaluation was useful to what they were doing, right? And it was kind of making that link just between the evaluation, just being all oh, this thing that happens over there. Uh, to actually being something more fundamental to the way this program was being delivered and, and, and monitored. Um, so, yeah, well, I, yeah, I like to think so. I think that's probably the only way I can answer that question. <laughs> um, we have any more questions for Demi? Patricia, Patricia, do you want to unmute yourself and um, elaborate? We have time. Yes, yes. Okay, hi, thanks so much. That's a fascinating project, so much hard work. I actually work with a fund, but it's much smaller scale than this. And I have so many questions, but one that you touched on that I think it's extremely important is the monitoring aspect of that. And um, I was just wondering if in uh, you had uh, attached to the outputs and outcomes indicators and if you did, um, what, what was really the problem with uh, monitoring? I mean, I'm, I think I can guess what you're gonna say, but given you know the multitude of people, the resource, what were the issues there? And what do you think you would have um, in hindsight now pressed a bit more for them to do? Because obviously some of those metrics are what really we can rely on to check if we are achieving you know, outcomes. Thanks so much, James. Yeah, I mean, that was something very early on, you know, when we discovered there was a snow market, because I was used to in the UK, a lot of programs uh, using this ODA money are funded through what was at the time the Department for International Development. And they are very strict on kind of, you must monitor this, They're very strong on the outcome frameworks and evaluation. Uh, and it was interesting, this program was being implemented through a different department who didn't necessarily have that experience um, of 
implementing this, this this ODA money. Um, so yeah, we very early on kind of mapped out partly building on that theory of change. Okay, well, what are the indicators that you want to measure for each of these outputs and each of these outcomes? Um, and we made some recommendations early on um, on that. I guess the challenge in doing that was because they had so many different delivery partners who were locked into contracts, um, which were very much focused on the delivery and not the whole administration side of it, which and they would consider monitoring to be administration. Um, and there was a, how do, how do I describe it? There was a, a, an exchange of views on the extent to which, um, you know, they should be collecting the, the depth and extent of the monitoring data that we felt would be useful for evaluation purposes. But not just for evaluation. For me, there was a big accountability issue for the department here about, you know, how are you justifying the spend? What are you actually achieving from it? Even simplest things like, you know, how many people are being supported or how many projects. Um, there wasn't, you know, a consistent way of doing that. Um, and, you know, we were trying to edge them towards, can you have a centralized system or at least a common set of indicators that each of the partners would report on? Um, and they never really got there, certainly where I was involved in it. We ended up having to do a whole exercise of collating all the individual monitoring data from the different people and then trying to bring it all together. Uh, and it ended up being really patchy. You know, we had some data from all partners on some things, some data from a few partners on others. So it became a really a real kind of patchwork. So it helped in a sense, but it certainly wasn't comprehensive. Um, so yeah, it was it was super difficult, and it was partly a kind of a contractual issue about the extent to which the partners were going to be expected to to collect all this data. Hey, hey, Thank you. Yeah. Hey, hey, Hawkins, I can see your uh, message. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, I can do. I just thought it was worth saying that, um, and it particularly, I guess, points to the value for money. And so value for who? Um, so at that point, the UK government, and still now, actually, was primarily concerned about value to the UK. And, and, and that, that really changed the direction of uh, official development assistance. So... Um, I, ICAI, for those of you who don't know, is an independent commission for aid impact, which is a kind of um, independent assessment um, uh, organization that looks at spending on UK aid money. Um, so there were lots of noises about the Newton Fund and uh, around the time. And so a, a uh, an assessment was commissioned and you know, amber red doesn't is not doesn't come up very often. So, um, so I don't know if it's directly related, but I know that Diffida don't you know stop funding it. Um, unsurprisingly, if you look at some of the findings in that report, but I don't know um, whether did the evaluation come up. I honestly can't remember; it's too long ago. But but was that pointed to in the evaluation? Yeah, some of those issues were uh, very much pointed to in that, and there were a number um, beyond the issue of funds staying in the UK. Uh, it's kind of, you know, what are we evaluating here? But there were also issues of kind of how much of it was really related to ODA eligibility, particularly under that people's strand. Um, there were funding lots of work to, you know, under the, well, to develop the skills, research skills, right? Um, and all, which is perfectly eligible for, you know, ODA, fund, ODA funding. But some of the research topics that we're funding them to do were very much not related to these global development challenges. So there was a huge debate around that as well in terms of, you know, how, so yes, this person's skills have been developed, but they're actually not got anything to do with the global development challenges. So that was a big issue from, from ICAI too. Uh, and we highlighted that in the valuation. Um, so uh, yes, and the, yeah, we did touch on some of these issues about, you know, where the funds were being sent, but effectively what we were asked to do was evaluate the fund as a whole. Um, and what is it achieving? And uh, so, yeah, it was kind of hinted at, but we were trying to stay out of the politics of that and say, well, here's what your fund achieved. But there were certainly some very real issues around, um, yeah, that, how this programme was actually aligned with um, ODA funding requirements, put it that way. And it's probably worth saying that's become an even bigger um, discussion recently. Yeah. So enough said on that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can 
think we have um, five minutes. There's a question from Rula on ensuring cultural competency um, across teams. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so the way we did that um, was to work with essentially local evaluators in each country that we, we visited. Uh, so we often we'd kind of double hat. We might have someone from the UK uh, to go, but also have a local evaluator on the ground who would kind of lead those conversations and provide that cultural uh, understanding and be able to input and lead those those discussions on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, Tetra was a global company, so we were able to sort of leverage the networks of contact, contacts uh, that we had so that at each case study, study visit had a local evaluator at its core. Uh, and that helped us uh, be able to navigate some of those um, cultural sensitivities and, and issues. Thank you so much, um, Jamie, for your time. If there's no other questions, I don't see any hands raising. Um, we might, oh, Rula, yes, thumbs up, thumbs up is always great. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insights on this extremely complex Newton Fund um, project. Um, we have plenty of people applauding and thanking you. I will do some Googling myself and I will read some of those reports. There's much for me to learn. <laughs> about how to navigate the complexities of international development on a massive scale. Thank you so much for your time.